PhD in molecular biophysics from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He then worked as a research associate in the area of structural biology at the University of Paris and Cambridge. He was an assistant professor of medicinal chemistry for five years at the National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research, Mohali. Additionally, Sir played a pivotal role in leading the drug design research at Dr. Reddy Laboratory in Hyderabad for a duration of two years. Currently, Sir holds an adjoint faculty position at the Center for Computational National Sciences and Bioinformatics, International Institute of Information Technology, IIIT, Hyderabad. He also holds the role of head academic program at iHub Data Foundation, IIIT, Hyderabad, and serves as a member of the academic council at IIIT, Hyderabad. The academic contribution of Sir encompasses over 75 research papers published in reputed journals. His research interests span across bioinformatics, biophysics, structural biology, and drug design, reflecting his dedication to advancing scientific knowledge in this domain. With this introduction, I cordially invite Dr. Gopala Krishnan, sir, to deliver his talk on the topic, Role of Artificial Intelligence in Pharmaceutical Research. I know, but signal doesn't has no problem with with the dose, wooden dose. Concrete is a problem. Wooden dose should not be a problem. Okay. Thank you, Zenat. Where is Zenat? Thank you, ma'am, for uh, inviting me uh, here. And um, so I don't know what you'll. I will keep asking questions and I want you to answer. Right? Um, do I need this? It is for online part is my okay. So okay, then Hello? Can they hear? How do we know that they can hear? Right. So, I will try to tell you a little bit about 
applications of artificial intelligence in drug discovery and diagnostics. Um, I, but I, I have some slides, but I don't have to cover all the slides. Depending upon how you respond to me, I will uh, cover all of them or cut it short to um, at a particular level, I'll stop. So I work here at the moment at IHUB Data Foundation. So um, is there a pointer? Pointer? Or this one? Okay. The above button. This one. This one. Yes. Below that one. This one. Yes. Yeah. So at I have data, we are concerned about something is happening. Yeah. Data is required for anything. We also have developed a lot of systems even before, long before artificial intelligence has come into being. For example, if, if they, do all of you know Telugu? Yes. Telugu? Zinat? Huh? I can understand. Can you tell me one proverb in English then? Knowledge is power. Okay, that's a difficult. <laughs> um, that's a difficult proverb uh, to explain with data. Knowledge is with with data only you get knowledge. So the so I wanted to explain to that. For example, if we say, I'll tell you. Oh, I just remembered one. Empty vessels make noise. Yes. How do we know that empty vessels make noise? That is because people have experienced it. Empirical, lot of empirical data, empirical knowledge has been accumulated. So on the basis of this empirical data knowledge, then this proverb has come into being. Empty vessels make noise. What is the equivalent in Telugu? Nindu kunda tonakadu. Nindu kunda tonakadu. Okay, so that's so that is a full part will not spill. Similarly, a, a, a half empty part, the water will jump. But the equivalent in English is empty vessels make noise. So similarly, there are many such things. So when we grow up, we slowly accumulate experiential knowledge. And that knowledge slowly gets ingrained into our brains. Our new, we are teaching the neurons in the brain all the time. So that is how natural intelligence evolves. So artificial intelligence is modeled on our knowledge about our natural intelligence. How the neurons work, we have some models. We don't know exactly, entirely, accurately how the neurons work. Because biology is still developing. This century is known as the century of biology because we are we are learning a lot of things about new biology which we don't know earlier. So therefore, the natural intelligence models are used to develop artificial intelligence. Is this clear? Anybody who has questions, please feel free to ask questions. Please by asking questions.
Yes. Okay. So, so where I work uh, at iHub Data, we focus on accumulating data, and this data is available to everybody. Right now, we are focusing on one area, one area is healthcare. Ah, yes. About so driving behavior, um, you know, knowledge about the traffic, traffic rules, all of those. Again, we need to understand in when we want to develop new models using artificial intelligence, we need to have two kinds of data. One is positive data. Another is negative data. If the model is derived mainly by using only positive data, then that model is imperfect. So when it encounters a situation where it corresponds to the opposite, it will fail. For example, we know we have traffic rules. If we only learn about what rules to follow is not enough. We also should know what we should not do on the road. So that this is very important to understand. For example, when you are developing a new chemical entity as a putative drug candidate, then we need to understand which type of molecules will have a um, will will el will elucidate a good pharmacological response and which other type of molecules will not elicit those responses unless we know both of them together it won't work have you all studied quantitative structure activity relationships anytime Quantitative structure activity relationships. It can be structure property relationships also. Yeah. In, yes. In, yes. In Madam's department in pharmaceutics, property is very important. Yes. So if if a particular tablet, if you are going to have a sustained release formulation, then you must know what kind of polymer to use. Why? Which kind of polymer coating? will allow the active pharmaceutical ingredient to diffuse at a particular rate. We need to understand the kinetics. We need to understand the thermodynamics. All this data has to be incorporated before we can even choose whether it should be polyethylene glycol or hydroxyapatite or any such thing. I mean, I don't know all the polymers, so Madam will, will know. So we need to have the data. We need to have various kinds of data. As much data as possible, we need to have in our hands. And we have to use all this data to make a judgment about whether a particular formulation will actually work, will actually meet our defined objectives. What was the objective? To develop a sustained release formulation. Right? So are we all on the same page until now? Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I have already given you a bit of introduction to artificial intelligence and then uh, you all know about drug discovery and drug development process, but still, I will uh, present it to you from the perspective of today's topic, that is, how artificial intelligence can be useful in the drug discovery and development. Okay, if time permits, I will also talk to you about some diagnostic applications. So we'll we'll go through these things slowly. 
Yeah. So before we get into the details, yes, you have a question? Ah, please. Online participants. Is it fine? Will I know if online participants have a question? Okay, how will I know that? No questions. Okay. okay. Sure, thanks. Is it all right? Has it changed? Is it working? Lag is it? Yeah, lag is something which we cannot help. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks. So, do you already know this? That artificial intelligence is any method which allows computers, that is machines, Okay, to think like humans, to do things like humans, to mimic human activities. Is that this is everybody knows about this, right? And similarly, we have other keywords, key phrases, machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is something which you have been using for a long, long time. When you do some assays. Yeah, if, when you do a pharmacological assay, for example, epinephrine assay or norepinephrine assay, then you do the plotting. And then when you when you are so you have collected data points. When you are doing the time assay or concentration assay, then you have for each variable you have some data and you plot a graph. When you plot a graph, Sometimes you cannot connect the points with the straight line. And then so what do you do? You do line fitting. You do regression. Yes? That all of that, any statistical application on the data, when you, when, when you treat the data with some statistical procedure, then it is always machine learning. Because machine... Machine can be just a calculator. So what you have on in your hands, your mobile phone, is much more powerful than this personal computer. You have more GBs, more MBs than this one has. So it is possible to do. So you already have the capacity to do artificial intelligence, which you have been doing. And so that is machine learning. Okay, you use statistical methods to improve learning. So you have data points, and then you want to do curve fitting. And then why do you want to do curve fitting? Because you want to understand the phenomenon that you are studying. The phenomenon here is okay, you have a molecule and you have fed it to the rats. 
or injected it to the rats and then the rat you are analyzing the uh, blood sample or plasma sample or urine sample and you want to understand what happened to this molecule you want to establish a pharmaceutical profile drug metabolism and pharmacokinetic profile of the molecule and for that you use statistics right same thing when you do bio equivalent studies or when you want to un understand bio availability then all of that we need to use statistics what is the tolerance limit for who in bio equivalent studies six sigma you know six sigma one ppm only one defect one sample out of a million samples can deviate if more samples deviate then no it's not acceptable there was a wonderful molecule from dr reddy's lab called raga glitazar for as an anti diabetic one rat died in the toxicology in 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 uh, phase 1 only one rat that's it they had to close that molecule one out of 2000 because the regulatory authorities will not accept even one fatality at the end of the day why are we doing drug discovery anyone what is the purpose of doing drug discovery public health okay yes to ameliorate a disease condition to improve the quality of life of patients yes is it clear i know you know this i know you are teaching all this but we need to keep reminding ourselves why we are doing this similarly deep learning i am spending more time on this particular slide because this sound like very big phases super technology nothing we are unnecessarily hyping them we must understand that we have to use our nat natural intelligence more than we use this artificial intelligence at the end of the day all these machines which we are training to do our job or our, our slaves they cannot become our masters yeah yes please tell your students or deep learning same thing <laughs> okay deep learning is a subset of ai and ml yes we use more neuron neurons more artificial neural nets sorry yes we use more more data and we will use more layers of artificial neurons in the simulation system so we call it deep learning for deep learning you need to have lot of data if you have only you know very sparse data if you have data only for 50 molecules in a structure activity relationship i say you know the activities of only 50 molecules deep learning is useless up to 20 molecules human mind can work perfectly fine the human mind will tell you hey look at the 20 molecules 
hey, this molecule seems to be better than this molecule. And then, so you give, give, give this set of molecules to your students and ask them to calculate and predict the toxicity values, whether, whether it is blood brain barrier penetration or, or say some other, um, what, is, what is that, monooxygenase mono assay, anything you can, or surface, uh, total surface area or hydrophobicity or log, that is partition quotient, anything can be predicted and then you can correlate with the activity and then whichever molecule is meeting all the parameters together perfectly, then you choose that molecule to take it to the next stage. For deep learning, you need a lot of data. Big data is useful for, for example, all your chat GPT, that is big data. Okay. All the documents in the world, Google or Microsoft has fed their system to read and understand. And based on that, if you ask a question, it gives you an answer. Does it give you the right answer all the time? Good, thank you. <laughs> so AI in healthcare. AI has been used in healthcare for a long time, as I said, we, without Without our regression analysis, without our graphing software, scattered plots, we can't do anything in either medicinal chemistry or pharmaceutics or pharmacology, toxicology. We can't do anything. So we have been using them, but we, are, we did not attach a label to it. Without any pomp and fanfare, we have been using machine learning calmly, quietly. But now, everything has been given a tag. That's all. Okay, so we have been using in research and innovation, and it has been used in a big way in medical imaging and diagnostics. We, we all know that during COVID period, to process the chest x-rays. Okay, so many um, big hospitals have used artificial intelligence because it's physically impossible for one medical diagnostician, the pathologist or radiologist to look at each and every x-ray when you have thousands and thousands in each hospital. So they ask, they, they give the images to the computer and then computer says, give some idea, gives a report. So based on that, you verify whether it is right. So if, if there are 1,000 x-rays to be looked at, if the machine says, hey, please take a look at these 45 images, then you will look at the 45 images and that that's that's a good thing. Other things, other other images are normal, so you don't have to worry so much about it. But we take the help. We don't completely leave the diagnostics job to the machine. If we do that, nobody is more foolish than us. Because machines can make mistakes too. They make less mistakes than humans. That is why we can rely on them sometimes. But we have to cross check. Always cross check. Similarly, patient care. So diagnostics is also part of patient care. So yes, so now I come to today's topic, that is artificial intelligence in, in drug design, which is the early phase, early discovery phase of drug discovery. Yes. So, the, there, there, is, there is a model here. It is the mix of mind that's our nat natural intelligence with that of the machine. 
So, how do we do it? We, we design and then we ask the machine to, to synthesize it. Okay, or a chemist can also synthesize it. And then we have to test it. We have to, we have to analyze the data, the test data, and then see, do we have to make more changes? So you generate a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, and then improve the hypothesis. So you go, you do several iterations of this hypothesis, Testing, testing means automatically you have to make the molecule, test it, and then come back to the hypothesis and modify the hypothesis, improve the hypothesis. So that's how, so from a hit molecule to a lead molecule and improving the quality of the lead towards a new drug candidate molecule that is the process. It's an iterative cycle. Of course, I'm skipping so many uh, things in the middle. The DMPK department is extremely important. So did you, did you understand this? Any questions? You can also, so there is, I, I, will, I will share some of these resources. You can also take a look at these resources. This is from Nature Reviews Drug Discovery in 2019. Okay. Ah. Yeah, so, so this bit here. So a chemist can make, a human being can make the molecule. Nowadays, we have robo synthesizers. We can use them also to make these molecules. They can make more molecules, but of course, you, they can only make limited variety of molecules. Whereas humans can make anything. So this is an extension of the previous cartoon. So in, in the drug design cycle, we have an interplay of inductive and deductive reasoning. These keywords you, we must know. Zenith, what is inductive? <clears throat> so, supposing we are meeting for the, we are meeting for the first time. You don't know me, I don't know you. No, just your facial recognition. Okay, so you will think, okay, uh, maybe I can talk to this person. This person looks pleasant. Yeah, so that part is what will induce you to talk to me. If I can take the chemistry example, you have a carbon atom in the ground state. It will be in the ground state only until another carbon atom or another, uh, another any other atom will approach, come close to this atom. Then what will happen? Yes. So the, the electronic clouds of these two atoms, they will excite each other. There will be electron electron repulsion, but nuclear nu nuclear electron attraction as well. Yes, these are called dispersive forces. And so that is when the carbon atom electronic configuration changes from the ground state to the excited state. What happens to the excited state carbon hybridization happens. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, 2p2. Then the 2s2, one of the electrons will jump into the p orbital. So then you have four unpaired electrons. Yes? So that is your excited state. And then only depending upon what other atoms are approaching, then 
hybridization will happen, whether it is sp2 hybridization or sp3 hybridization or sp hybridization. Yes. So that is so in in docking in in drug design, we call something known as induced fit mechanism. Okay. So you have a molecule, you have a receptor, and then you bind it. Binding happens. And if there is complementarity, shape complementarity, charge complementarity, if both these are available, then it will just fit like lock and key. But maybe it is not there in the, in the receptor surface. But when this molecule is approaching the binding pocket, this molecule can induce changes in the structure of the active site in such a way that so the, this molecule, small molecule is inducing the receptor to make local changes. And then the fitting happens. Okay, that is induced fit. So the, any keywords like this, we must try to get to the bottom and understand it. Then, then, then only we'll be able to teach the students what they mean. Deductive reasoning. What do you understand? Assume that I don't know what is deductive reasoning, so you tell me. Say it again. I am I'm not able to understand. Uh, uh. So you, you can you can translate what she's saying. Eliminated. Okay. Okay. So Again, we can go back to the the proverb which we were discussing earlier. Yes, empty vessels make noise. Yes, how did you deduce this? <laughs> huh? Whatever. So different people have done different carried out experiments over time, and at the end of it, we have deduced that any vessel narrated by a computer need not be the medicinal chemist. It can be the computer. It need not be a chemist also. It can be a biologist. It can be a pharmacologist. Yes. So anyone can uh, generate a hypothesis. So that's the start, the hypothesis. And then you have to test the hypothesis. We have discussed in the previous cartoon that this cycle, is this iterative cycle continues until we reach the desired goal. Okay, so we keep doing this again and again. Deduction, induction, deduction, hypothesis, synthesis, test. We design the hypothesis until we get to the end. Yes, any questions? <laughs> Questions? Feel free to ask questions. Yes, we when we when we understand when we apply our deep thinking to these simple words, then we can train our students much better. We have to allow them to think. Okay, so uh, this, all of this, you know.
voice is not coming. Okay. So, we have to do this jugad <laughs> basically. <laughs> Anyway, so and then we we go to the clinical trials, dosage, toxicity, efficacy, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and then we come to the market and surveillance. Okay, at, at the life cycle stage, we have to do the surveillance of what is happening to the approved molecule. That data is also important because with that data and with the help of AI, we can develop a better formulation which can be more effective than we have from the. artificial intelligence in the analysis of say host pathogen interaction do everybody understand what is host pathogen interactions please Okay, so do you know how uh, COVID-19 virus? Okay, what, which part of the coronavirus interacts with which part of the host cell? No, let's not forget it. Anyone else wants to add to what your friend is saying? I only know Zenith's name, so but I don't want to put her in trouble all the time. Yes, on this side. No? How does coronavirus enter? Your chance is over. <laughs> no. What about spike protein? What about the spike protein? No? We'll move on. Already 45 minutes over. <laughs> I'm still in the beginning. <clears throat> yeah, so host pathogen interactions. For example, we have a very intelligent parasite called Plasmodium falciparum. Yeah. Really incredibly intelligent. It doesn't require any artificial intelligence. It, can, it is able to survive in two hosts which are very far away from each other in the evolution. Uh, tiny mosquito and, uh, and, the, and the biology is so different in the mosquito gut and, and the uh, human blood and liver. Yeah. So it, it has to be terribly intelligent to be able to do this. 
jumping from one organism to another and then survive and multiply and create havoc. And then again, we, we talked about the identification of novel targets, artificial intelligence is being used. Um, designing of compound libraries, I will touch upon it in the, in the next few slides. Drug target interactions, that is also what we have just discussed. And also how the drugs act on the signaling pathways. So people have been using, there are lots of examples in the literature that is available. And similarly, I talked about the structure activity relationship and estimating the AD, MET properties also. So artificial intelligence can be used and is being used. What add, add me
I could have used my laptop and then speak. Should have been very. If it's a USB connection, it will be better. So, it's not moving. Okay. Yeah, so in addition to all these big technology companies, there are many startups. So in, in, in this slide, I'm, I'm saying that the, so at the stage of understanding the disease mechanism, but the early stage, early discovery phase also, there are some companies involved and this list is very old. Now there will be 30 such companies in the list. Similarly, biomarkers or targets, many companies are there. So what today I'm going to, I was th thinking I will say uh, something is in the generation of new chemical entity. Okay, because um, this is early discovery First, we must have molecules, and then how how can we generate new molecules to which can be targeted against a particular enzyme or receptor? That's that's the focus. So, what is the need for artificial intelligence-based quality? And if there is a good balance of quality and quantity, then your AI model will be successful. If you, if you recall in the very beginning, I said, we need both positive as well as negative data. We have to train. We have to know what we should do as well as what we should not do. Then it will work. In QSAR, the guiding principle is always if you have 100 molecules for which you have enzyme assays, then if the activity range spans from the, the, the bad molecule to the good molecule, there should be at least log 4, four. in the log scale. The, the difference should be at least four. If it, if you have the weakest molecule is in millimolar, then the best molecule should be in nanomolar. Then only your QSAR model will be effective. Otherwise, no. If 90% of your molecules are having very good micromolar activity and one or two in the nanomolar activity. No. Also should have some molecules which are in the millimolar range. Very bad molecules, very good molecules, and then nice spread of intermediate activity molecules. Then the model will work. So data, yes, data is very important. And good data is even more important. Okay, so uh, these papers, maybe you have seen them be before, but it will be good to good you go through these papers uh, to understand the power of AI. Basically, I'm not going to explain this uh, now. Okay, these are very very interesting papers. 
okay, rapid identification of potent DDR1 kinase inhibitors. Similarly, deep learning approach to antibiotic discovery. These all happened in a very short span of time. And then the whole world set up to say, hey, this is something which we need to use. Right? I have already told you about Pac-Man, designing anti-cancer drug from transcriptomic data, basically mRNA sequencing data via reinforcement learning. And all these, all these spaces which the artificial intelligence community uses are not any different from what we have actually been using in our pedagogy. We teach some concept. Then we ask the student, use this concept to solve this problem. Yes, so that is the same thing. So you, you have trained the student with a particular concept. And then you gave the problem to the student. And the student, if the student has understood the concept, then the student will be able to solve your, the problem that you have posed by using transfer learning. Reinforcement learning is again using the using several worked out examples of the same concept. Yes, just like our our Fidji Gidji they do. Keep on giving same type of problem like a machine students learn to solve them like pattern matching basically. So same thing, those concepts, the usual pedagogical concepts that we use, the approaches to teaching, approaches to learning methods, we apply the same methods in training the machine. Yes, have you heard of Montessori, kindergarten, same thing. So. We treat the machines like our students and then teach them how to solve a problem. And because they, they are machines, so they will repeat the process many, many times much easier. OK, so a based drug design can reduce the initial drug discovery time from many years to actually a few days. So the, this, if you if you see these papers, some of them you'll say that they have done it in very very short time, in less than three months, from hypothesis to final molecule application for a new drug application has been done. Right, little bit of technical information I want to share. I am sure all of you know this. We have the cholesterol sulfate here. In the, this is the 3D representation of the cholesterol sulfate molecule. This is a 2D representation of the same molecule. Okay. And you can represent it, represent this, this molecule as a string of characters. Do you know this smiles format? Anyone? Who knows the SMILES format? No medicinal chemist here? Any medicinal chemist? Pharmace pharmaceutical chemistry student? Raise your hand. Be proud to be a chemist. Yeah? Are you proud? I am. I did my BSc and MSc in chemistry. Yeah? Chemistry is everything. Sorry? Yes. OK. So basically, the, this molecule can be represented by this string of characters. And this is known as the simplified molecular input line entry system, abbreviated as SMILES. So we just call it as a SMILES string. Why is it important to represent this complicated three-dimensional structure of cholesterol sulfate? 
Cholesterol is a very important biological molecule. Why is it important? Because machines will find it difficult to understand this, but strings, very easy. Because in, in computer science, we use binary logic, Boolean logic, right? So zeros and ones, yes and no, basically, most of the time. Now, so it is easy if you give it a string of characters for the computer. So it, it is simplified. So the amount of data that is required to store this information will be much smaller than when then if you have to define so many things here. Here, if you have to define, you have to define it in terms of internal parameters, such as atomic coordinates or bond lengths, bond angles, torsion angles. Yes. So, so many geometrical parameters you have to define to give this. But here, no. The, the stereochemistry will be incorporated but most of the geometry is not required here. So what the computer, what you, can, you can ask the machine to learn the grammar of this. This string A is written with the help of this Miles grammar. So this can be back translated into this molecule easily. So that is what we are going to do. We use, we use an artificial neural network machine, okay, which we call it as recurrent neural network. And we give the input in the form of smiles, strings of many molecules, about 1.6 million molecules from a database called CHEMBL. Okay. So, for each one of these 1.6 million molecules, we have converted them into this SMILES input format and we have input it to this machine which uses recurrent neural networks. I am not a neural networks expert. I am a structural biologist and chemist. So, so this, if you want to understand, I can help you. We have programs in IIIT which will help you to go through foundations in machine learning. Or my former team members, they are all experts in this, this, this particular thing. Smiles data set, embedding layer, which is all, these are all computer programs. Stack augmented bidirectional GRU, these are computer components. There is computer programming components, okay, which I am not an expert of. But just assume this as a black box at the moment that it is an intelligent neural network system. Okay. So the concept is what we need to understand. So we give the smiles data and then the what comes out is new valid smiles output so the machine can generate new molecules based on the knowledge it has gained from the input data that we have provided Right, so we generate new small molecules and then we then construct one more machine which will predict the properties of the new newly generated molecules which are which are not in the database. <clears throat> Okay, so the, uh, then this is trained on data sets of smile strings and their corresponding 
experimentally verified property values. So we must first train the system, train the machine to correlate the structure with the properties. Basically, structure property correlation, we are asking the machine to learn. And when the machine learns this, okay, and it can predict the partition coefficient, uh, polar surface area, or melting temperature, or any other property that we require, which we which we have defined and then given the training to the machine. It will calculate. How do we know if the calculated properties are correct? We have to validate them. Okay, so uh, the data, the machine is trained on data sets of smile strings and their corresponding experimentally verified property values. And this is utilized for property prediction and property optimization. Remember, when we do all this, we want to have a better molecule than what we have. That's the whole purpose. We can do it by ourselves or we can ask the intelligent, artificially intelligent machine to do the work for us. And we combine both these machines, yes, in, in a, to optimize the properties. What we do is we have our generative model which uses recurrent neural networks. Same thing, predictive model which, you, which also uses recurrent neural networks. And then we call this as the agent, and we call this as the critic. Okay, and this generates new smiles, that is new molecules. And these molecules, for these molecules, this predictive model will predict the properties of interest to us, whatever we have asked the machine to do. And then we check whether this the the output of the machine is useful to us or not if it is useful we give it a gold star if it is not useful we will give it a black star yeah that's all so then so that reward punishment model we use and then this is learning this generative model is learning hey i generated this molecule but then my master said it is not good, so I should generate something which is which doesn't have that kind of property. So it, we we do this over several cycles, and then we get some optimized molecule. So it depends on how powerful your computer is, how whether you have good GPU on your machine and what is the amount of data you are using and uh, what is the um, endpoint that you require, what kind of precision you require, how many properties you want to optimize. We use them for validation purpose, only for testing only. So 3,681 molecules were considered for transfer learning. And then we validated, we used the JK2. The results are 6,106 potential new chemical entities. Remember, we are asking the machine to generate new molecules, which are different from the training molecules. Yes. And then, so uh, obtained after property filters and virtual screening, because Remember, we asked the, the second part of the machine to, to calculate the properties. So, and then we filter them, filter the molecules based on these properties because we know our target scaffolds. 310 molecules from the generated set of molecules have Tanimoto coefficient above 0 0.75. 
to the validation data set. What is the validation data set? Which have known molecules against JAK2. Remember, we did not use these molecules in the training. So the machine was able to generate new molecules which are similar to molecules which bind to the target, which is JAK2. Is it clear? Or if you have doubts, ask. How are we doing with time? <gasps> End. <laughs> 3 30. Because I have another meeting at 4. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I don't know. Here you see some some dark blue thing. These are the molecules which are similar to the validation data, that is molecules which are specific to JAK2. Okay, and these are the scaffolds of those molecules. So, with after we have validated the model, we wanted to check it with a new unknown system. So, this was during the COVID. Yes, do you have a question? Okay, so we used the coronavirus system for doing it. I'm, I have to stop now because we are out of time. Yeah, we used the uh, SARS-CoV-2 chymotrypsin like 16 protease, uh, also known as main protease. So we, we tried to develop some molecules for this, which we did, okay. so. This is how we did. We generated 50,000 molecules. We validated chemically. We could get 42,000 molecules out of these generated molecules because the rest of these miles were not uh, easy to translate. Then after using the physical chemical filters, we, were, we got 3,900 structural alerts filter. And then virtual spinning, we did docking of these molecules. So that is virtual spinning. And so we got this many molecules. And then we did, we checked them against known HIV protease inhibitors, this, this inhibitor. And we found that, so this inner circle are these, are, are these molecules. And then these molecules are the ones which are similar to the generated molecules, which are similar to these known molecules. So this is, this is how um, good we could achieve. So these are some of the molecules which we have uh, got in the final list. Okay, and we also got some. Some of these molecules were also similar to some natural products which are arantamide. Okay, so so these two molecules are similar to uh, these avantamide molecule. So this, these were given to um, NCL and CCMB for testing. Okay. So nothing came out in the end, but we have been able to develop a model and which we could use for generating new molecules against a new target. And so with time, our model will only improve and we, we may actually get some molecules. Okay, so I stop here and then these points, we have already discussed some of them. Data fidelity, how good the data is, uh, is it good? And then we have to be careful about how we use the AI technology in taking decisions and we should be very careful not to make wrong decisions, thinking that AI is, has given us so we can uh, completely believe it. We have to validate each and everything. So, and that we can do by incorporating common sense. That is our natural intelligence we must use, right? And these are uh, methods that are in, in development at the moment worldwide 
computer scientists are trying to develop methods which can tell us about so right now most of the um, ai and deep learning models are like black boxes but we don't want them can the machine also tell us why it generated a particular molecule if the machine can give us some ideas about why it generated these 3000 molecules based on the input data that we have given it then it is, it becomes much more powerful and it will be useful and then we can add our intelligence to the artificial intelligence model and really achieve good results the the uh, holy grail of um, therapeutics is that can we have a therapeutic use take the help of artificial intelligence to do that yeah formulations also it is about properties yes hmm formulations also we should be able to do it for example but i don't know if if people have been able to use it for polymers okay but salts yes what it it's like it's it's, a, it's about it's about the property why do you why do you use a particular salt in a formulation instead of instead of using um, uh, uh, fumarate if you are using maleate is there an advantage what is that advantage in in practice so this information this data you can tell the machine huh. what what other thing yeah so stability parameters also you can only with respect to the api only hmm. what about other excipients which we are using right. so when you add an excipient when you add the excipient what does the excipient do to the api you know it when you add an excipient so either the stability has increased or uh you you have made it more stable at a particular ph and when you are doing all these things the data you have to collect that data you have to digitize and then tell the machine hey if i have this excipient this ad this adjuvant is causing this end end result for me okay so what other similar adjuvants can i have which can give me a better result so it's possible it's very much possible similarly polymorphism you can do it <laughs> sorry i didn't i actually thought i will ask you more questions but ended up asking questions myself and answering them i hope it was useful i hope you have learned something yes so you can always get back to me for any doubts my email is with uh, shalaja madam okay thank you very much any projects can assign to the colleagues i don't know at the moment so all the models that i have discussed these are developed in uh, tcs tcs being a company i don't know how open it will be but i will talk to them and i'll ask them um, but yes all my uh, colleagues are also doing this type of seminars in various colleges and uh, it should be possible if some model that they can uh, provide to our colleges for
for teaching and learning is possible. I will talk to them. Any last questions? <laughs> If I was 33 years, maybe I wouldn't have, you know. Thank you, sir, for delivering a talk on the role of artificial intelligence in pharmaceutical research. Sir, it was very wonderful, informative talk, sir. You kept all the audience captivating with your talk, sir. We are very grateful to you for sharing us with sharing your knowledge and expertise with us, sir, and for your enlightening talk, sir. Now I request our principal, ma'am, to kindly felicitate, sir, with a memento as a token of gratitude. Photo. You come over oh, that side out.
It is to inform all the participants uh, to fill the feedback form, which was given in the common link. Link is given in the messages. Please see your chat and fill the feedback form. Thank you.